Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Man, it's good to be back here at Southland. This stage brings back so many memories. This, uh, this very building brings back memories. Many of you bring back many memories. I'll pay you back. Anyway, um, you know what? I sound like Walter in the morning in my mind when I'm singing in the shower. I sound just like that. Uh, what an incredible service. What, uh, Keenan's fantastic communion. What a great insight into that thief on the cross dividing. You know, that's, that's amazing. Uh, I feel like we've had a great service already. Um, I've kind of cried my eyes out already all week, but uh, I, I, I hopefully I won't do too much today. But uh, it is great to be with you guys to preach uh, just my not, not final sermon, final sermon, but not quite, you know, maybe I'll come back. Maybe I'll get invited back. I don't know what we call it, but uh, it's great to have, of course, Dr. Zelena and Kit McKean here with us. I'm so glad you guys are here for this service. And, and all my friends and family here visiting, you're like, who's this guy? I don't know. Let me share with you one of my favorite passages of Scripture. I thank my God every time I remember you. And all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel. From the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about you since I have you in my heart. Philippians chapter 3, chapter 1, verse 3 through 7. It's just great to be here this morning with the West Regions and Southland. It's just great to be with you guys. <laughs> uh, it's been a crazy week, a week full of U-Hauls and and packing boxes and bubble wrap and, and uh, all of you guys who've been able to help cleaning supply house. My house smells like Clorox and Formula 409 and all the going away meals. I'm so grateful to the church and grateful to be in God's kingdom. I'm really grateful just to be alive today. Uh, I'm grateful to, to, that we have such a great church foundation here in Los Angeles. I'm so grateful for the brothers and sisters here today and the partners in the gospel who have the same dream and have the same Lord. Let's go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. we got some work to do. Amen? Oh, where do I start? Uh, it was Super Bowl Sunday, 2014. I was sitting in a sports bar uh, in Minnesota. It was 12 below zero. And uh, I was alone. In uh, many ways, uh, departed from God. I was uh, uh, eating spaghetti. And... Um, and I got a call on my phone. This was like at, almost at 11.30 at night. And, uh, and it said 503 in the area code. Like, who do I know from 503? And I picked up the phone. It was Kit McKean. And uh, you know how God always says it. You know, he's always got a friend out of a thousand. He's always got a friend to help pull you back in. And, and we had the talk. And, uh, and he just implored me to to come back to God and come back to get restored and see God's face again. And uh, it was a life-changing moment for me. I remember it like it was yesterday. And, um, and I remember hopping in a U-Haul, uh, very similar to the one in my driveway right now. And driving here, and I, I remember coming in, and I'm pretty much a broken man. I, I would, had left God years before, and uh, I was alone. Um, I remember getting to the California border in my big old U-Haul and seeing that welcome to California sign and had had my Bible there and I was already starting to get repaired my relationship with God. And, and then, uh, you know, fast forward, I, I, you know, got restored in April of 2014. I was able to get restored back to God and, and, uh, and Kip had said, Kip said, you, you, it's going to be a great journey, you know, uh, and so it has been. It's amazing to celebrate uh, my last birthday. It was my 30th spiritual birthday in the Lord and uh, 30 years. So, uh, you know, that does count for something. But um, fast forward to Memorial Day weekend. It was uh, May 31st, 2021, when, uh, uh, when April and I moved here and first arrived to the West region. And I remember that first Sunday morning preaching a lesson about heaven. <laughs> and when we all get to heaven, what a, what a day of rejoicing that will be. I, I still remember that. And, and uh, I thought about how I came down here, and, and I honestly believe it was, it was a very emotional time. April and I really just had a simple goal. We wanted to strengthen the church here for God, with God, that would honor God. That was really our simple plan. We wanted to build a, a family of disciples here 
that, that would be willing to push back the borders of God's kingdom and to expand God's kingdom. And, 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 and I think 18 months and 75 or so sermons later, many leaders lessons and Bible talk lessons and staff meetings and stuff, my voice is tired, but uh, I truly believe that that is what we've done, is we've built a, an amazing family here for God. <laughs> And I think about that move, uh, it was 18 months ago, you know, it was only uh, really 54 miles away in 55 minutes, depending on how fast you drive the U-Haul. My life seems to be a lot about U-Hauls. But it was a very emotional time moving here to the West region from Ventura, but I honestly believe that my move tomorrow morning to San Diego is going to be even more emotional. Uh, we, now, is just I. I was married on this very stage, March the 1st, 2015, and as I say goodbye to you today, I realize that we've come far, but we still have so far to go. We have so far to go to see our cities, one for Jesus Christ. We have so much to do. 2022's year of the Spirit is soon to be yielding to 2023's year of miracles, and I believe we're going to have some miracles and I think it never before has it been more important to combine our experiences, our faith, our convictions, everything that we have and understand together what must be done for the future of this church. And to that, I'm going to preach to you this morning. First Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9. We are co-workers in God's service. We are... God's field, you are God's field, God's building. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder, and someone else is building on it, but each one should build with care, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. I love that passage. But that passage reminds me that we are in a race against time because Satan is an expert destroyer. Yeah. Satan's trying to destroy everything we do. As we make plans and decisions today that are going to affect our year uh, in 2023 for the future of our church, Satan also has a plan. You know, as we begin to think through who we are, who we'd like to be, where we'd like to go, believe me, Satan has a plan. You know, as we begin to make goals for ourselves and start thinking about resolutions, where we're going, believe me, Satan has a plan. Everything we're going to do for God's glory, I guarantee you, Satan has a plan. But God says he has a plan too. It's plans to prosper you, plans to, to give you hope, not to harm us, to give you hope in the future. But Satan has a plan for you as well, and that is always going to be the opposite of God's plan. Satan absolutely wants to harm, harm you. No hope, no future, nothing. No prosperity. We have got a destroyer walking around our grounds today, and from what the Bible teaches, he's also an expert at destroying. In the spirit of, of 1 Corinthians 3, what I just read, we must become expert builders. We have to be these people. We have to be. We cannot just be church leaders. We cannot just be strong disciples. We cannot just be spiritual decider, disciples. We have to be spiritual builders. We have to build God's kingdom in our generation. We've got to be spiritual expert builders and so that the kingdom of God can march forward and to him be all the glory. Amen? Amen. I think this is why I'm so inspired to watch the Good News Network. I love the GNNs when they come out. I'm like, I always watch it, and then I watch it again, then I watch it again, then I show it to the congregation, and I send out the link and stuff. I love watching these videos each month, each month that they come out. It's why I love visiting other churches' websites. It's like why I like going to conferences and stuff. I love to see what God is doing all over the world, even in New Delhi. We got a disciple from New Delhi here today. How cool is that? I love to see what's happening all over the world. I love to hear the good news and, and see what our brothers and sisters all over this globe are doing and helping people find the Lord. I marvel at how God's sold out movement literally has multiplied from that small group of 42 disciples in May of 2007. And here we sit 
Over 10,000 disciples, 124 churches, 37 states, 56 nations, all over six continents of the known world. That fires me up. I think here in Southland and here in the West, God has also raised up an incredible building to himself. Whether it's expertly built, I cannot say. Time will tell. But I want to challenge you this morning, all of you, with some things that I believe will help you and inspire you to carry on the torch. And not just to do it for me, not just to do it for L.A., for Jason and Sarah Dimitri who are coming down to lead this super region, and lead this amazing church, to Ole and Regina Oradola, to Matthew and Selma Rodriguez who are coming down, not just to do it for them, but to take your Christianity to the next level. To not vacate here in December, to, to take your Christianity to the next level, to be even better under our new leaders than you ever were before. You know, here today, God has raised up an incredible building for himself. And, and i got to tell you, when I first came down here, to be honest, uh, we were once limping along. The first services were quite scary. I was worried. Some people had one foot in, one foot out. Some per people weren't sure if they wanted to be here uh, some people weren't sure if they even wanted to build. And, and, and there was a sense of defeat. But I look 18 months later, and we have a group now that is ready that's truly turned into a family of disciples. Move back into this building I love. Fighters that are sold out to do God's will. And we've witnessed marvelous baptisms. Some of you have been baptized recently. Marvelous restorations. Building for God. We've had weddings, fantastic res restorations, even some good old-fashioned maturing in the Lord. And we've seen that. And, and this has been the most generous group of people I have ever seen in my life. Thank you, Paco, for sharing that as well. I'm hesitant to say I'm an expert builder. I will say it is my ambition. But I, we, I will say that I am a builder. And I want to challenge everyone this morning to be a ministry builder. And who's he talking to? I'm talking to you. Be a ministry builder. Well, God, bro, I, I don't know, bro. I'm not in the full-time ministry. It doesn't matter. Go build your ministry. I don't know, bro. I'm really not sure what my role is. It doesn't matter. Go and build your ministry. I don't, I don't really know what to do. It doesn't matter. Just go build your ministry. Go build your ministry. Well, I don't know what a ministry is. What about your neighborhood? You have a neighborhood? That's your ministry. Go build your neighborhood. Amen? Just build one Bible talk in your neighborhood. Just one. Build a Bible talk in your neighborhood, and from that one Bible talk, build a second, and then build a third, and build a fourth, and build a fifth, and guess what? You're going to become a ministry builder so that you won't have enough room in, in your house for all the disciples to come in, and you can be a great ministry builder. That's the goal I'm going to have for the rest of my life, that no matter where I go, I'm going to be a ministry builder. I don't care who pays my salary. And doesn't God deserve that? Doesn't God say that this is to his glory that we bear much fruit? Matthew 9, verse 29 has eight very powerful words. Just eight words. I love them. That can help make you today a great spiritual leader. And I think these nine words, these eight words, can help be a spiritual turning point for your life. Here's the eight words. According to your faith, let it be done. According to your faith, let it be done. Today, I want you to make a commitment to build. This is so much more important than baptizing. But to build. Commit today to become a great ministry builder. Because I guarantee you Satan is going to have many, many plans to try to stop you from reaching your goal. But decide today that you will commit into your heart that you're going to be a great ministry builder and a great builder for the Lord. Now, I'm about to go the way of all the earth. You know with all your heart and soul that not one of all the good promises the Lord your God gave you has failed. Every promise has been fulfilled. Not one has failed. Joshua 23, verse 14. I think about this. I'm like, 
God has truly given us so much to be grateful for here. Not one of his promises has failed. He's given us so many, so many just the opportunity to even have a relationship with him. He's given us incredible wives, incredible husbands, incredible children. Your children are growing so fast, my gosh. Great communities to work in, to live in, to play in, to pray for. Uh, he's given us such remarkable friends. I look around and just I see friends. That's why it's so easy to be a public speaker because I've just got friends here. It's just friends. It's just you. You know what I mean? But remarkable friends. I mean, we're living in a social media world. Where I, I love that I have friends to, to tell the world about. Look at my friends. Look at the things we're doing. I have friends and I, I can build memories with these people. We have a church that's full of loving people who just want to be friends and want to love God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. What more could you want? That's what it says here. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. 2 Corinthians 2.20. God has been so good to us. And I think God has been so good to me. And I, I think we have so much to be thankful for. Another turning point, a fork stuck in the road. Time grabs you by the wrist, directs you where to go. So make the best of this test and don't ask why. It's not a question, but a lesson learned in time. It's something unpredictable. In the, in the end, you'll find, I hope you've had the time of your life. So take the photographs and the still frames in your mind. Hang it on a shelf of good health and good time. Take all your memories and laughs you can compile. For what it's worth, it was worth all the while. It's something unpredictable, and, but in the end is right. I hope you have the time of your life. I love that because I hope that you look back on this time years from now and say, man, those were the good old days. I had the time of my life that one day, 10, 20, 30 years in the future, you'll look back on this time right now and say, man, those were the good old days. I know I see the pictures. I don't know what I was wearing. I don't know about that haircut. I don't know about that. I, man, I looked pretty slim back then, you know, um, but I hope you look back on this time now that we've had as the time of your life. Uh, you know, man, those awesome times where we were worshiping the Lord. Man, those weddings. Remember at Ashton and Cara's wedding? That was incredible. Remember those baptisms we had? Remember when so-and-so got baptized? Now look at her now. Look at him now. All those cookouts, all the food, all the barbecues, all the bonfires, and all the wings. My gosh, we're keeping Buffalo Wild <laughs> We're keeping them in. I should have bought stock in Buffalo Wild Wings. I don't know about that. But, but remember when we met in that hotel, there was only like 30 people there, and that was incredible. And remember watching our children being born, and, and now they become best friends and playing together and grew up together. And what, man, those hair, that hairstyle, what were we thinking? <laughs> but how great it was to be in Christ back then. We were so young, some of you. Um, <laughs> But I think if you're in Christ, every day should be like that. Every day is going to be the time of your life. Every day, every week, every month, every year is going to be a blast. And it's just going to get better and better and better because you're in Christ. How cool is that? I think one of the things I love most about this all is the great friendships. I, I think sometimes we underappreciate how good it is to have great friendships. There's people out there that are starving for great friendships. They have acquaintances. That's one thing I, I remember most about when I left God is that this trying to make a friend. You know, you're at the gym. You're like, uh, hey, you want me to spot you? <laughs> that's, uh, that's weird. Hey, what you doing later? Oh, that's weird. You just have nothing in common, you know. Hey, you must work out. No, that's that's. But we have great friendships here in the kingdom. I love that we have great friendships. If you don't, shame on you. But I'm talking about real friendships, not casual acquaintances. You say, what is a real friendship? Let me read you what a real friendship is. A godly friendship. If you're my friend and you're concerned about my soul, give me the truth. Don't flatter me with praise or my virtues while remaining silent about my sins. And do not fear to be truthful to me. 
Don't treasure our friendship above my relationship and my maturity. Do not think that by ignoring my sins that you can help me out one bit. And do not think by being blind to my sins that you prove that you love me. However I may act, whatever my attitude may be towards you, after you tell me, give me the truth. For the truth and only the truth can set me free from the shackles of sin. Our friendship strengthens strengthens me in the path of righteousness and will lead me to the joys of heaven. If I am wavering, if I am weak, if I am lukewarm, if I'm indifferent, if I'm neglectful, or if I've been overtaken by sin and have been drawn back into the pleasures of this world, or if I have left or forsaken my first love, God, or if I've been led astray, or if I've done none of these things, but simply just need to grow in the Lord and be edified, give me the truth. That's a real godly friendship. Just be truthful to me. I'm so grateful that we get to live by the truth. I'm so grateful the truth is the only thing will set us free. That's what Jesus said. Go over to John chapter 17. I think it's so important to realize that that's what we need most in our life. We need the truth. And there's nobody that went around preaching more about the truth than Jesus Christ. He was always telling the truth. He was always starting his, I tell you the truth. Truly, I tell you. Verily, for some of you older folks. I mean, listen, I'm telling you the truth. He was always telling the truth. And that's so different than what we see in, in the religions around this world today. And all the religious folks out there today, there's lies, there's deceit, there's this, this false teachers. And, and I really want you to appreciate today the truth that we have in Jesus Christ. Just give me the truth. There's a little passage here in John 17. He's praying, longest recorded prayer here in the New Testament. And Jesus said in verse 13, I am coming to you now, talking to his father. But I say these things while I'm still in the world so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. The full measure of my joy within them. Y'all want to hear the word of God this morning? The full measure. This is phenomenal. Jesus says, I want you to have the full measure of my joy in you. Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't it be great to be able to look and just see a church that's full of the measure of joy that God has given us? What if we could crack open the heart of Jesus just once and see what was inside? Wouldn't that be amazing to just just see what was in Jesus' heart? I mean, I look at that and I thought, just crack it open and see What was in Jesus's heart? We should all want to, because if we say we're a Christian, that just means we're trying to be like Christ. Amen. We're committed to being like him. That's another sermon. But if we were able to look inside the heart of Jesus, what would we see? Number one, we would find a zealous heart. We'd find a zealous heart because Jesus was full of zeal. Jesus was all about zeal. You look at the, Jesus had a blast. I look at the Gospels. He was someone who had fun. He was a dynamic person. He was doing things. Some people think of Jesus as being distant and boring and staid. And, 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 well, he wasn't. That's not the Jesus I read about in the Bible. I love the story of Zacchaeus and the tax collector, Luke 19. The Bible says he was in that sinner's home having a good time. Uh, Jesus probably laughing, having a great time, and he was so full of joy. Why? Because he said, today salvation has come to this man's house. I get fired up. I get joyful when people get saved. I still get fired up about that, amen? You know, this guy had repented, and he's like fired up. When he's walking on water, I mean, he's out walking on water, and it's a ghost. He's like, (laughs) I think he was having a great time with his guys. You know, I was in the army for years. I know what it's like to, to be with the brothers out there making fun, you know, having fun, doing crazy stuff. I don't know. But I think Jesus probably had a lot of fun. I believe he laughed a lot. I believe J- Jesus had a, a, a zestful life. I believe he had a zealous life, that he was a zealous man. I believe he loved life. I believe when you were around him, you would just feel this exuberance, this enthusiasm, this, this electricity, this ecstatic person, because that's who he was. Jesus was very magnetic. He said, I have come that you may have life. And if that weren't enough, I've come that you may have life to the full. The abundant life. There's actually a version in the Bible that says life to the max. Ethan knows what that, you know, life to the max. I don't know if that's even outdated now. I don't know. but, But I just think that Jesus probably had this infectious joy and enthusiasm and personality. Everything he did was with purpose. He walked with a guy with purpose. Why, why did Jesus knew, number one, he knew what he was doing. Two, he knew where he came from. And three, he knew where he was going. Do you know those three things? Do you know 
what you're doing, where you come from, and where you're going. He had a purpose for everybody he talked to. Jesus always had a purpose. He had a great time in his life. It's interesting to read through the Gospels and look at all the places Jesus went. I mean, I think about it. He went to beaches. He went to lakes. He went fishing. He went to weddings. He was hanging out. He went up to the mountains. He did some hiking. That's probably pretty cool, you know. He had big picnics. He had fish fries. I mean, somebody even counted the fish. How many fish we got? 153. How much batter are we going to need? You know, he had fish fries. He went sailing. He went boating. He went to dinner parties. You see Jesus at dinner parties. He loved life. And, and everything he was doing all the while, guess what he was doing also? Making disciples. No matter what you're doing, go and have fun, but make disciples as you're having fun. Don't lose sight of that. Amen. But I think that's exciting that as the founder of our church, we have someone who loved life. When I was younger, I used to think that being a Christian meant like sucking on a dill pickle or something. No one ever had any fun. Be quiet. Shh. We're worshiping. Be quiet. I'm not quiet. I never was quiet. I was listening to Ayanna do her resume there, and I was slunking deeper. And they're like, wow, president of the president. I was president of detention. I would take names in detention. That's, that's where I spent my time. I just wasn't quiet. I don't like quiet. If you're trying to be quiet, is this the wrong church for you? It's two miles and to the east. But this is not that church. We're the church that talks back and we let people know that I'm here. Amen. <laughs> but I, I think never forget to enjoy life. Disciples are the people who need to have the greatest fun in life and who get the most out of life. And people need to see the joy in our lives. That's what's attractive. Not a fake joy, but a genuine joy that springs from our, work, our walk with God. Jesus made every experience an event in his life. Every day was special. And so that's the challenge for us. Number one is to have a zealous heart, just like Jesus. That's what people are attracted to. I don't know about you, but I don't like to spend time with boring people or dull people or lifeless people or people who have nothing to talk about. I like to spend time with people who are interesting, who are fun to be around, who are really living and who are really excited about life. And that is a disciple. A single day, a single day in your courts is better than a thousand anywhere else. I'll just take one day, one day. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to live a good life in the homes of the wicked. Psalm 84.10. I read that somewhere. Do you feel that way? And sadly, many outside the Lord never experience for even one day what we experience in the kingdom every day. If you could crack open the heart of Jesus, what else would you see? Number two, you'd find an extra mile heart. Look over in Mark chapter six. Come on, I get to preach a little bit this morning. An extra mile heart, a heart that went the extra mile. If you have an extra mile heart, it's going to make this the time of your life. I promise you people who go the extra mile, you can always spot them a mile away. I've seen it this week, just in my own home, people who come over and help, you know, I had the, the Southland teen ministry come help me this week. I was blown away. And they weren't just sitting down there, you know, holding down the fort. They were helping. I was like, whoa, look at those guys going. You know, I traded in my, you know, uh, you know, my back and everything, you know, kind of walking around. Because, you know, I have the U-Haul, but you have the zeal. You have the muscles. You have the strength. You have the energy. I have the money. You have the energy. That's the way it works. I'm pay, I'll pay. I'll get to pizza. You do the lifting. But it was good to see Southland's teen ministry come. Uh, my God, the campus ministry was cranking. Paco and Haley brought the campus ministry over there. They was working. But you can see someone who goes the extra mile. You just see it. And, and you know what you also see? You see when somebody doesn't. Hey, bro, I really need you. Can you come and help me? You can tell right away. You don't have to say a word. You can tell somebody just doesn't want to serve. Do you have the extra mile heart? People's got a great attitude about it. They have a great heart for God, living high, loving it, because they're always thinking about other people. They're never thinking about other people's situations. They're always thinking about, how can I serve? What needs can I make? What can I do today? They're not thinking about who's giving them compliments or who's going to praise them. They're not thinking about anything else, but what can I do to care for other people? What is the need? Can I go the extra mile? How can I pour out myself for the life of others? Mark 6, verse 30. 
The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all that they had done and taught. Then because so many people were coming and going, they didn't even have a chance to eat. He said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So he went away by themselves. They went away by themselves to a boat, to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed, he saw a large crowd. He had compassion on them. He had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. Here's Jesus, very tired. It's been a long day. It's been a long week if you follow the Gospels. And, and boom, there's crowds again. There's more people. You know how it is. You know how we feel. We're tired. More people, more interruptions, more problems, more chaos. Give me a break. I mean, Jesus even scheduled a break with his guys. Here's many guys. Let's get away. Let's get some rest. Come on. Let's go to a quiet place. Anybody remember a quiet place? I live by a big old highway. But, but what happened? There's the crowds. They just kept coming. They kept coming. The needs kept coming. The, the, the Bible says they even ran ahead to meet him. Like, I said, like ants or something. Like, wow, there's more people. There's more needs. There's more things. And so what did Jesus do? What was his godly reaction? It's right there in verse 34. Compassion. That's an extra mile heart. Compassion. He had compassion on them. For they were like sheep without a shepherd. And then the Bible says, so he began to teach them many things. Not a quick one-off. Not a quick two second. Many things. By this time, it was late in the day. So his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, Jesus. They said, it, it is already very late. How do you feel when it's very late? I feel tired. I, I, I don't know about you, but when, when it's very late, I want to take a break. I want to relax. I want to chill. But here, his compassion for the lost trumps his fatigue. It trumped everything. Everything he was feeling. And the Bible says that he teaches him until it was very late. It's a remote place. It's already very late. It's very late. He's tired. He wants to go away and take a break. But he sees that. I think compassion causes a person to make sacrifices. When you have the compassion and that extra mile heart, you will make sacrifices. You won't even think about it. it, it you will give even before people ask. Verse 36. Send the people away so they can go get to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered, you give them something to eat. Jesus was always challenging his people. You give them something to eat. Hey, you know what? I've got a better idea. You give them something to eat. You do it. Jesus was always asking us to do more than we thought we could. He's always putting us in difficult situations. He's always asking us to do the impossible. This is Jesus. It's challenging to be a disciple. You're right. It's challenging to be faithful. It's right. It's challenging to be a godly husband. You're right. It's challenging to be pure. You're right. It's challenging to sleep less and have less than my next door non-Christian neighbor. You are right. But you know what? Jesus wouldn't have it any other way. He would have it no other way. God does not want a bunch of spoiled brats. And here's the newsflash. God doesn't have grandchildren. He only has children. And he don't want a bunch of spoiled brats for children. He wants people who rely on him, men and women who will go all over this known world and preach the gospel wherever it takes. People who want challenges, people who want hardships, people who want difficulties, people who don't want that cushy, easy life. And then have great attitudes about it and be content. We have to have the compassion of Jesus. I love it. Number three, if you could open up the heart of Jesus. This is important. This is, I add this. You got to have an angered heart. An angered heart. Look at Mark chapter 3. An angered heart. You know, every time I read the Bible, I find something more. Every time I open up the Bible, I get excited because all the treasures in this book, all the nuggets in this book, I love it. One thing I've noticed in the gospel is how many times Jesus would say things in a loud voice or how many times he cried out because he was so, so intense. And occasionally Jesus would just let it out. See, we knew lots about the lamb Jesus, and that's great. We have the lamb Jesus. It's awesome. He's holding the sheep and stuff, and, you know, he's like, you know, you see those in posters and stuff. But, man, he knew when to bring out the lion Jesus, too. 
He knew when to roar. And here in Mark 3, he lets out the roar. And I love you know, when Lion Jesus shows up. You see his angered heart. Uh, verse 1, another time Jesus went into the synagogue. A man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. So they watched him closely to see if he would heal, them on the, heal him on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with a shriveled hand, stand up in front of everyone. I love that Jesus never did things in secret. Stand up in front of everyone. This was no secret mission here. He, Jesus loved Sabbaths, didn't he? He loved busting traditions and busting up everything that stood in between man's relationship with God. He could not wait to heal on the Sabbath. He'd probably be sitting there like 5, 59, 59, and 6. Let's start healing. Let's start healing. And, and be boisterous about it. Walk past and don't wash your hands. And, you know. I mean, he wanted people to know. He was busting up some old traditions, you know, blasting away at traditions because he was trying to bring glory to God. But look at this. He said, stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil? To save life or to kill? But they remained silent. And what was Jesus' reaction when they couldn't say a word? You know, when you, you remain silent, you... you, you I, 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 Look what it says. He looked around at them in anger. Now, we've all had someone look at us in anger before, right? That may be just me. I don't know. Maybe me and a couple of real folks here. But <laughs> you ever had your dad or mom or your teacher or your drill sergeant or somebody look in front of you look at you with anger? Now, of all the people I would not want to look at me in anger, Jesus Christ, my Lord, is not one of them. <laughs> But can you imagine the angry look? You probably, I don't know, melt your heart. I don't know what to do. But here it says, God's looking in your heart. And he says, hey, buddy, you got to get it together here. I know when someone loves me unconditionally, they're going to tell me what I need to hear. I know there's times people are going to, you know what you need to do, R.D.? You need to repent. R.D., you need to stop. You need to start, get up and start doing what you're supposed to do. And it doesn't have to be long. But it's spoken in love. I know Kip got me at EMC. Kip pulled me aside. And he, you know, he said, bro, I got some things I've, I've noticed. Here's some things I need you to see and repent of. And if that weren't good enough, he excused another brother and said, can you excuse us a second? <laughs> Come back. <laughs> he got in there again. And I, 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 he, he knew I wasn't getting it. Next morning, I walk in, I see Kip, I see the other side of the room. Uh, bro, 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 bro. Come on. Bro. You know, I called Michael Kirchner and, I, uh, and, and got me again. But we got to love discipling. I don't care how old you are, I don't care what you've done, I don't care how many medals you got, we got to love discipling. We got to love discipling. And sometimes you, you say, well, you're supposed to be like Jesus. Well, Jesus might turn over some tables. Jesus might look at you in anger. Jesus might look at you and start firing you up. He looked at them in ang anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts. Ooh, you ever have a stubborn heart? <laughs> he said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. Here's a guy trying to heal somebody on the Sabbath and they're all upset, but they decide to kill a man on the Sabbath, and that's okay. But, but he had deep convictions. In fact, these convictions that led him to the cross. But Jesus' heart had an angered side to it. Do you get angry when he cleared the temple of the people's sins and what they'd done to his father's house? We need to get angry and upset at a sin. Sometimes we got to get angry at the state of the condition of our church. Sometimes we've got to say, this is not right. We need to get upset about ever. I don't care if it's blatant sin. When was the last time you just walked out of a movie theater? Because this is just not righteous. I shouldn't be here. Man, I hope I'm not in that movie when the Lord comes home. I'm just, that's not where I want to be found. Jesus didn't just walk by sin. He couldn't do it. He couldn't walk by sin. The other side, blah, blah. but Jesus could not walk past it. And he did not wait for someone else to do it. No, he said, this is ungodly. This has got to change. Are you that guy? Are you that woman? And I think that's what we got to decide in our lives. We got to start hating sin more and more. And we got to start getting angry when we see things that aren't right. I'm not talking about a sinful anger. In your anger, do not sin. But a righteous indignation. You got to look at things in anger. 
he cleared people's sin. I mean, me, if we develop the heart and the conviction, if we're really going to be like Jesus, you'll have the time of your life. Uh, finally, last point. I know some of you like when somebody says that. If you could open up the heart of Jesus and look inside, what would you see? You would find a loving heart. This is the lamb. Jesus was the perfect combination. Romans eleven twenty two. Consider therefore the kindness and sternness of God. Is God a kind God or is God a stern God? The answer is yes. <laughs> but you'd see a loving heart. Jesus loved people. And that's why he said the greatest command is to love God and love people. The greatest of all the commands, the, the greatest? Yeah. And he challenged us to love each other. And he challenged us to love our enemies. And love whoever, I don't care who it is, Jesus loved. A zealous heart, an extra mile heart, an angered heart, and a loving heart. You know what that spells? Zeal. And you'll have some zeal. And not just to have zeal to have zeal. This ain't a pep rally. It's zeal so that we can take this church to the next level. Our zeal for God's house. As I depart from San Diego to San Diego, I'm reminded of the words of Paul in Acts 20. You know how I lived the whole time I was with you, from the first day until now. I served the Lord with great humility and with great tears in the midst of severe testing. You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but taught you publicly and from house to house. I have declared to everyone that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to San Diego, not knowing what will happen to me there. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish this race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. The task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. For I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. So keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. Be on your guard. Remember that for, well, 18 months, I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. Now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and everything I did. I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. Remembering the words of the Lord Jesus himself, it is more blessed to give than to receive. When Paul finished, he knelt down with all of them and he prayed. And they all wept as they embraced him and they kissed him. I think my charge to you is to take care of each other. Be shepherds. Be your brothers and sisters keeper. Love one another deeply. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Be zealous. Be zealous for this mission that God has called us to. LA is going to have some fantastic changes coming up. We got some fantastic leaders coming down. It's going to be a year of just renewal and refreshment and it, it's going to be I guarantee you but this time next year you're going to say wow this really was the year of miracles but don't look for miracles you be the miracle be the miracle be an expert builder in God's house whatever you, you do whatever you think whatever wherever you live be an expert builder in God's house be faithful to God because of the promises he's made and one day I pray that you will look back on these days truly as the time of your life I love you guys. To God be all the glory. <clears throat>